1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 1. Finally then, brothers, we ask and urge you in the Lord Jesus, that as you received from us how you ought to walk and to please God, just as you are doing, that you do so more and more. For you know what instructions we gave you through the Lord Jesus. For this is the will of God, your sanctification, that you abstain from sexual immorality, that each one of you know how to control his own body in holiness and honor, not in the passion of lust like the Gentiles who do not know God, that no one transgresses and wrong his brother in this matter, because the Lord is an avenger in all these things, as we told you beforehand and solemnly warned you. For God has not called us for impurity, but in holiness." Therefore, whoever disregards this, disregards not man, but God, who gives his Holy Spirit to you. Now concerning brotherly love, you have no need for anyone to write to you, for you yourselves have been taught by God to love one another, for that indeed is what you are doing to all the brothers throughout Macedonia. But we urge you, brothers, to do this more and more and to aspire to live quietly, and to mind your own affairs, and to work with your hands as we instructed you, so that you may walk properly before outsiders and be dependent on no one. But we do not want you to be uninformed, brothers, about those who are asleep, that you may not grieve as others do who have no hope. For since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so through Jesus... God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep. For this we declare to you by a word from the Lord, that we who are alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command, with the voice of an archangel, and with the sound of the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, 
and so we will always be with the Lord. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. We have been studying this first letter to the Thessalonians that is teaching us how to live our lives in light of eternity. As we have our eyes focused on the glorious return of Christ, Paul has a concern for these Christians, which is a concern for all Christians. We'll notice this in verse 1. Finally then, brothers, we ask and urge you in the Lord Jesus that as you receive from us how you ought to walk and to please God, just as you are doing, that you do so more and more. Paul taught them how to be pleasing to God while he was with them in Thessalonica, and he urges them to do so more and more. Paul states in verse 2 that these Christians know the instructions that they gave to them when they were with them there. Notice what their instructions were. Sanctification, verse 3, for this is the will of God, your sanctification. The will of God is your holiness. God wants you to be holy. And we should not be surprised by this. It's a message that God gave to Israel while at Mount Sinai. This is quoted in the New Testament and applied to Christians that we need to be holy because God is holy. Peter tells us that in 1 Peter 1 and in verse 15. We need to take in this idea for a moment. God's will for you is to be holy. A lot of people want to know what God's will is for their lives. They look in the strangest places to find God's will and purpose for them. But here's one of those purpose statements that our Creator has given to us. We don't have to go search on a mountaintop somewhere in the Himalayas to figure out you know, what is the meaning of life and what does God want from us. God has told us. God has given us this in His instruction manual. I heard once that the acronym for the Bible is Basic Instructions Before Leaving Earth. And that is so true right here. This is God's will for you. Your holiness. Be holy. Holiness matters to God. Now, verse 3, Paul's particular point about holiness is that we use our bodies in ways that are holy. Notice that Paul says your holiness looks like this. To abstain from sexual immorality. Sometimes we can think of the Greek-Roman world in the first century that it was just so different from our culture that we live in today. We don't walk around wearing togas, for example. Sometimes we have a delusional thinking that that world was more godly and less depraved than today. But I want to share with you some quotes from the first century to see that this is not the case at all. Demosthenes said, quote, We keep mistresses for pleasure concubines for our day-to-day -day bodily needs. But we have wives to produce legitimate children and to serve as trustworthy guardians of our homes. It was expected that young men engage in sexual relationships before marriage. Cicero said this, Let not pleasures always be forbidden. Let desire and pleasure triumph, sometimes over reason. Cicero also said, if anyone thinks that young men should be forbidden to have affairs, even with prostitutes, he is very strict indeed. For his view is contradictory, not only to the law of the present age, but even with the habits of our ancestors and with what they used to consider allowable. For when's this not a common practice? When was it blamed? When was it forbidden? When, in fact, did that which was lawful become that which was not lawful? Antipor of Thessalonica said, quote, Homer said all things well, but best of all, that Aphrodite, the patroness of prostitutes, is golden. For if you bring the cash, my friend, there is neither porter in your path nor dog chain at the door. But if you come otherwise, Serbius himself, the multi-headed dog of Hades, is there. Plutarch gave advice that a wife should not be angry for husband sought sexual pleasure with another woman. He advised that it was better that they close their eyes to the philandering activities of her husband than to complain and so jeopardize good relations with them. Archaeologists have even found graphic sexual frescoes in the homes of the Pompeys from the first century. The paintings of sexual acts were painted on the dining room walls. Now I say all this to say this. Don't get into your mind that Paul is teaching something that the culture was already doing. It was not. This culture would have heard these teachings about abstaining from sexual morality as completely crazy and foreign to common wisdom and thinking. In some ways, it would be like me standing here in the South and saying, hey, you need to abstain from sweet tea. 
Maybe that was the kind of the same reaction. Paul's teaching on this was just as radical then in the first century as it is today in our culture. In fact, it appears that this teaching would have been more radical in the first century. What God commands regarding having holy bodies is not some antiquated teaching from a bygone era. People did not agree with it then, just as they do not agree with it now. Now, the Greek word underneath our English word sexual morality refers to adultery, premarital and extramarital relations, homosexuality, and all perversions beyond one man and one woman for life. Holiness is the avoidance of sexual sin. Any sexual activity outside of marriage between a man and woman is being expressly condemned here. In verse 4, what the Apostle Paul says next here is, is considered absolutely impossible in our culture today. Each one of you know how to control his own body in holiness and honor. God's will for you is to control your own body. This is something you can do. Just because you have desires does not mean that you have to fulfill those desires. Just because you have a desire does not mean those are good desires. Our culture stands in direct opposition to the words of the Apostle Paul here. Our culture says a woman has a right to choose. Two people have a right to be married. And a person has a right to define its gender. What you think your rights are is not the issue. God, through the Apostle Paul, says the will of God is for people to control their bodies in holiness and honor. You have the ability to control and channel those desires. Notice that Paul contrasts this with how the world handles their desires. We do not control our bodies like the world in the passions of lust. We are to abstain from things that are characteristics of the world. And this is one where we're called to be different. We are to take control of our bodies. This passage literally reads that we are to possess our own vessel. This means we have to declare war on pornography. The numbers that come out about how many people who claim to be Christians who are involved in pornography is staggering and sad. Men and women have both been captured by this sin. We have to declare war on the television shows and movies that we are watching. Those programs and movies are not only things that we're not supposed to look at, but they in fact ignite a passion and lust in us that is not honorable or holy. We live in a time when sexuality and sensuality is flaunted. We are making control over these desires and over our bodies difficult, if not impossible. If we allow ourselves to watch such things. We live in a time when sexuality and sensuality is flaunted. We are making control over these desires and over our bodies difficult, if not impossible, if we allow ourselves to watch such things. There is just so much that is produced today that we should not be watching. Now I want to share with you an app that is really great to help us with that. An app and a web browser, that both of these are really good. This is something that we use in our home and it's really great for keeping our minds and eyes pure. I wanted to share with you a couple of websites to go to to help you filter the content that comes through on your TV and movies. Uh, the first one is called VidAngel. Uh, it's one that my family, we've been using for several years now. Uh, very simple to use. Um, just hit the get started button and it'll take you to this screen. Which streaming services do you subscribe to? Um, you know, generally Netflix uh, from Amazon Prime Video, Apple TV Plus, Peacock. Um, they do several others as well. Uh, but you just click the ones that you have, hit continue, and then it gives you uh, the places where you log in to those uh, streaming services. And once you do that, then it shows you the movies and that that are available. Uh, as I said, Disney and several others are not available because of a lawsuit, uh, but I'll show you how to get those as well. But what you do is you select the movie that you wanna watch. So for this, we'll say, we're gonna watch Jurassic Park. Um, now, what we need to do first is to set our filters. Now I've already set ours. Now I've already set ours as a default. Uh, so at default, it's filtering 54 scenes and show you how this works. So you click on it, it shows you what you'll see, it shows you what you'll hear. This is all the places where it mutes. I've got profanity muted, blasphemy muted, sexual references, innuendos, 
um, you, know, you click on the modesty uh, to see immodesty, see what it is, and it gives you uh, details, right? Um, so you say, well, I'm you know not needing to see that or that or that or that. So we'll just go ahead and knock that out. Um, even violence, even non-graphic violence, a man falls off a platform onto his face. Right? You can decide if that's too much for your family or not. And then you can say, ah, filter that. Even drug and alcohol use, other things. Uh, so it gets really detailed. And then all you do is hit save. And then you're ready. Press play. And you're ready to watch the movie. Um, it also works on Apple TV devices if you use those um, on your computers, on your phones, your tablets, um, just about anything. Uh, so Vin Angel's good. It's also very affordable at $9.99 a month, so 10 bucks a month uh, for this service. The other service that we use in order to get Disney movies, because nowadays you have to filter even Disney movies, is ClearPlay. ClearPlay works right in your web browser, uh, so it's not an app uh, in itself. And I think that's the way they get around um, being able to filter Disney movies. Um, but you just click the login, and the same kind of concept. You log in, um, and you select the movie you want to watch, select the um, filters that you want to put in place, and then you just press play. Uh, very much similar uh, to how VidAngel works. I will say it's not as user-friendly. Um, the layout is a little more difficult to, to maneuver around. Um, but it does work. Uh, we were able to watch some Disney movies uh, with the kids recently uh, and filtered out things that we didn't want um, them exposed to. Uh, during Christmas time, we watched Home Alone, and uh, there's some language in there. We were able to filter that language. It's a little cheaper than VidAngel. It's $7.99 a month. If you have a smart TV, uh, then you can cast uh, your screen to it, be able to watch it. I hope these have been helpful to you. If you have any questions at all about how to use these services, um, just reach out to me. Be glad to sit down with you and, and help you get through those uh, difficulties. By the way, they don't sponsor this program. We've also tried to find ways to block content on the internet uh, in our home. The best thing that we have done, though, is put the computer right there in the main room of the house where everyone can see. In short, we're coming up ways with helping each other stay accountable. If you have other ideas about accountability, please feel free to comment and let us know and share the things that work for you and work for your family. The point is we need to have these kinds of roadblocks to help keep sin out of the home. We need not to be passive. God's will is that you are to control your own body. Now, beginning in verse 6, God now gives us why it's important for us to possess our bodies in holiness and honor. First, sexual morality is wronging and taking advantage of another person. Now the word there for his brother is a Greek word that is aldotheos, and it's not a gender specific word. And it can refer to a man or a woman in Christ. Put it another way, someone is getting hurt when there is sexual morality. If you're married, then your spouse is being defrauded and wronged when you go to another man or another woman. This is one reason why God allowed divorce for sexual morality. You have defrauded and wronged your spouse when you gave yourself to another person. But if you're not married, you're defrauding your future spouse. You have allowed yourself to be with another person that you are not to be joined to. This is a gift that is to be given in marriage, giving your whole being, body and soul to your spouse. Purity is a precious gift. This is the idea that the writer of Hebrews notes when he speaks about marriage, marriage is to be held in high esteem and remain undefiled. Hebrews 13 in verse 4. But I want to add to this idea even further. In this culture we live with sexuality, have you noticed something? Women are being taken advantage of. Children are being taken advantage of. The news seems to be relentless in reporting how woman after woman is being defrauded and wronged. More and more we're seeing children abused and exploited sexually. There's nothing holy about sexual morality. There's nothing loving about sexual morality. All that it brings is emotional hurt because people are being defrauded and wronged. Now listen to what else God says about sexual morality in verse 6. The Lord is an avenger in all things, as we told you beforehand and solemnly warned you. Sexual sin is often classified as a personal issue. 
God says that you are hurting other people and this decision has eternal consequences. The Lord is an avenger when it comes to sexual morality. Let's state this another way. God does care if you commit adultery, if you sleep around, if you engage in premarital sex, divorce, remarry, and everything else that centers around sexual relations. We are deceiving ourselves if we think that there are not eternal consequences and eternal punishment for sexual morality. God is very clear. God is so clear about this that Paul says that when he was with them before, he solemnly warned them about this. When Paul came to Thessalonica, one of the messages to them was to stop the sexual morality that ran rampant in that society. God's will is your holiness, and God avenges sexual morality. Thirdly, God has not called us for impurity, but holiness. You have a God-given purpose. Paul highlights this truth again in verse 7. You have a different calling. You are to remain pure. You are to keep your body holy. You are not called for an impure life. Do not think that being a Christian includes participating in sexual morality. Do not think adultery is acceptable. Do not think that pornography is not a sin. Do not think that you can look at whatever you want and touch whomever you want. You have not been called to impurity. You were purchased by God for the price of the precious blood of Jesus. You are called to be holy. And then in verse 8, you are not rejecting cultural norms. You are not rejecting tradition. You are not rejecting puritanical values. You're not rejecting Victorian customs. You are rejecting God. If you are involved in sexual morality, you are disregarding what God has clearly taught. Adultery is rejecting what God has said. Sleeping with someone who is not your spouse is rejecting what God has said. Homosexuality is rejecting what God has said. Pornography is rejecting what God has said. Paul makes it plain. You are disregarding God when you disregard your purpose to be holy. Paul shifts now from talking about love that is lustful kind of love to a love that is brotherly in nature, loving one another. The Apostle Paul writes to them about loving one another, but tells them that he does not need to write to them because they've been taught by God. These Christians understood that loving one another was a critical characteristic. If we do not love one another, then we are not disciples of Jesus. Not only were they to love each other, they were loving Christians all throughout the region of Macedonia. But there are ways that we show love to each other that we may be neglecting. Sometimes we can have a shallow picture of what it looks like to love one another. Since Paul has no need to write about all these reasons why the Thessalonians need to love each other, since they already are doing this, Paul teaches them some deeper applications of what it looks like to love each other. So notice what he says here in verses 10 and 11. For that indeed is what you are doing to all the brothers throughout Macedonia. But we urge you, brothers, to do this more and more, and to aspire to live quietly, and to mind your own affairs, and to work with your hands, as we instructed you, so that you may walk properly before outsiders and be dependent on no one. Jesus said the world would know that we are disciples of Jesus because of how we love one another. What this means is that how we live our lives Monday through Saturday has an impact on what people think about Jesus and about us. Loving one another is not something that only happens inside of the walls of the church building. What we do when we are at home has an impact to the world. What we do while at work sends a message to other people. What we do when we are engaged in our hobbies and chores will say something to the world around us. Paul is observing these truths in these verses. So what does Paul urge these Christians to do? But to live quietly. Make your ambition to live quietly. Loving others means living at peace with others, free from hostility and conflict. We live quietly. We're not looking for attention. We're not desiring people to look at us. We do not cause conflicts and make problems. People get along with us. We do not stir the pot. We do not make matters worse. What Paul says is that we make it our ambition to be quiet. Think about this in the life of Jesus Christ, who he was and what he came to do. He did not make a lot of noise. He did not draw a lot of attention to himself. Jesus did not cause trouble or bang a drum everywhere he went. 
trouble came and attention came because he was doing God's will and showing the glory of God through his teachings and actions. But he did not make a display of himself intentionally. Neither should we make a display of ourselves. Make it our goal to be quiet and live a quiet life. Secondly, notice that Paul says that we show love by paying attention to our own affairs. We do not meddle in the affairs of others. We're not nosy, desiring to know everything that is going on with everyone else. Meddling is not love. We can have a preoccupation of wanting to know what everyone else is doing. We want to know what is going on in their lives. We want all the gossip. We want all the details. It is not that we are showing a genuine care for the person, but we are gratifying our own desires of wanting to know and to be in the loop. We want to be in the know. But this is not love. Let people open up to you. Do not pry into their lives. Let them reveal what they will about themselves as they get to know you and trust you. Build a relationship of love and trust so that you can share your lives with each other. No one wants others prying. There are some things that we just are not ready to share yet. There may be some things that we just can't speak to others about yet. All of us have pains and hurts and we work through those things with each other in different ways with different people at different times. We have to recognize this with each other, but also be there for each other. However, being there for each other does not mean digging or prying. Unsolicited advice is terrible. We saw this when we studied the book of Job. How often the friends of Job would tell him what they would do if they were him. But you're not Job, and you don't know what his circumstances are. It is high arrogance to tell someone what you would do if you were them. People ask you, you can tell them what you would do. Hey, what would you do if you were me in this situation? That's fine. But don't be proud as if you have all the answers. Mind your own affairs. Attend to your own business. And then he says to work with your own hands. Being idle and doing nothing is how we get in a lot of trouble. Working is something that God has given to men and women. Sometimes people think that work was the product of Adam's sin and the fall. Before sin was in the world, God made sure they had work to do in the garden. Just look at Genesis 2 and verse 15. The Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and keep it. All humans are to work. Now this does not mean that everyone has to have a corporate job or else they're sinning. But men and women are to keep busy with work. Doing nothing is bad in God's eyes. Whether we stay at home or retired or have some sort of physical difficulties, God tells us that we need to be doing something to keep ourselves occupied. We, ha we even have an old English proverb that says, an idle mind is a devil's playground. Some folks think that that was in the Bible. It's not in the Bible. It's just a traditional saying. However, the proverbs in the Word of God are also filled with warnings about idleness and laziness leading to a life problems. We always need to be looking to do good works, whether it's in the job, in the home, or in the church. We must not allow ourselves to grow idle. Idleness is dangerous to our souls. It does not show love to others. Now in verse 12, Paul states the reason for these instructions. So you may walk properly before outsiders and be dependent on no one. God's purpose is that you would stay out of trouble and not need others to support us. Live quietly, mind your own business, and work with your hands so that you will not cause problems to those who are outsiders and will not be in need of others to have financial care for us. Chapter 4 concludes with Paul talking about the coming of the Lord. Now there are not many passages of scripture that reveal what will happen when Christ comes a second time. However, you would think by the numerous books and movies about this topic that there were hundreds of passages that describe the second coming of Christ. People have such a fascination about Christ's return. This desire to know about his coming is not misplaced because his return is to give us hope and change how we live our lives today. But the purpose of what Paul is saying here is not to give us a full discourse about the end of times. The point is not to describe all the details or to give full treatment regarding Christ's return. Paul does not say, here are the nuts and bolts of this, folks. No, there is a specific concern these Christians have and Paul is going to answer that for him. It's stated in verse 13. But we do not want you to be uninformed, brothers, about those who are asleep, that you may not grieve as others do who have no hope. 
Now, it's very easy to misunderstand what the Thessalonians were concerned about if we don't know what the common thinking was about death and the afterlife and the Greek-Roman world. The Roman world believed in life after death. Immortality of the soul was widely believed. If you've had any, any exposure to Greek mythology, then you are aware of this. But Hades was a joyless gloom for departed spirits. The spirits continued on in afterlife, but there was no belief in a reanimation of the body. Now, we haven't got there yet in our daily Bible reading, but when we get to Acts chapter 17, the Apostle Paul encounters this when he speaks about the resurrection to the Athenians, and that caused a lot of them to stop listening to him. Some mocked him when he spoke about the body coming back to life. Others said that they would listen to this again sometime later. Now, it's important to note that the issue is not about life after death. They believe the spirit continued to exist in some underworld or Hadean realm. Therefore, Paul wants to make sure that they are informed. And notice what Paul says we must pay attention to, beginning in verse 14. He says, Our foundation is that we believe Jesus died and rose again. This is a critical component of our faith. In fact, we are not believers in Jesus at all if we do not believe that Jesus died and rose from the dead. But please note that Jesus dying and rising again was not the continuing life of his spirit. Resurrection is the body coming back to life. Believing in the resurrection of Jesus means that Jesus came back to life in the body. Jesus rose from the dead not as a spirit being, but as the body that the apostles saw, spoke to, and touched. Jesus puts back on the human body, and the apostles touched the wounds where the nails were driven through his hands. John 20, verse 24. Paul says, since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, we believe God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep. Falling asleep is a metaphor for death, yet it also possesses the hope of resurrection. They're not dead, they're asleep if they will wake up again. Notice what Paul is doing. In verse 13, he says, he does not want these Christians to grieve as others who do not have hope. So, what is the hope that he presents? The hope is not that you will live in eternity with God. Read verse 14 carefully. Since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, we believe God will bring with him those who have already died. God will bring with him those who already died. Christians have no need to grieve as the hopeless. Those who are not in Christ cannot have a positive view of the afterlife. God will bring with him those who are already dead. Is this not the great question that hangs over every funeral? Is there life after death? Is this the end? Is there any hope? The clear answer is yes. If we believe in the resurrection of Jesus from the dead, then we believe that God will bring with him those who are dead. So, verse 16, what will happen when Christ comes? Paul explains, The Lord is going to send from heaven with an arousing outcry, with the voice of the archangel and the sound of the trumpet of God. The dead in Christ will rise when he comes. God's victory over death is our victory over death. No one is lost in death if we belong to him. It does not matter what happens to your body. God proves that he will raise those who are his from the dead and bring them into life with him eternally. Thus we see life in verse 17. Those who are alive when Christ returns will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. Please notice what Paul is highlighting. We are caught up together, not with him, but with them. The Christian hope is not only Christ's coming, but he's bringing the dead in Christ with him, and we're joining together with them, with the Lord. This is the end of verse 17. So we also will always be with the Lord. The Christian dead are not separated from Christ. Verse 14 says that the Christian dead are with him. Further, the Christian dead are not separated from the Christians that are living. Verse 17 says that the Christian dead are with them, which refers to those who are alive on the earth when Christ comes. So listen to the conclusion in verse 18. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. We have hope. This is one of the great things we celebrate in the Lord's Supper every Sunday. Death does not separate us from God. When we die, it is not over. We are not annihilated. 
We're not cast into a gloomy underworld of departed spirits wasting away for eternity. We're with the Lord, awaiting our bodies to be resurrected in chain. Not only does death not separate us from God, but it does not forever separate us from each other. Another stunning hope that is given to us is that our separation from each other is temporary. We will be with each other, with the Lord. We will not only be caught up with Him, but also with them. And folks, that's what gives me hope. My grandfather was a gospel preacher and an elder in the Lord's Church. Shortly after I began preaching the gospel, he was diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease and then died a few years later. I would love to be able to spend time with him one-on-one -on -one as I have grown in the faith, grown in my knowledge of the scriptures, to discuss with him the things of the Word of God. I long to do that. One day I long to sit with him again and to share together what this glorious life in Christ is. And you have relatives too that have died in the Lord. We all have friends and relatives that we long to see again who died in the Lord. Paul tells us we will see them again one day. Therefore, our grieving at death must never obscure the hope of the gospel. We miss being with our loved ones in Christ now, but we know just as assuredly as we believe Jesus rose from the dead, that those who died in the Lord will be coming with the Lord when he returns and will be caught up and meet the Lord in the air with them. Folks, not only does this encourage our hearts regarding death, but it must encourage our hearts to be holy and to live faithfully to the Lord because we have the great hope of the resurrection. Serve the Lord and have the hope of resurrection. Thanks be to God, who gave us Jesus, who conquered death and rose from the dead, so that those who are in Christ will also conquer death and rise again. Therefore, comfort and encourage one another with these words. Next time, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. I look forward to that study. Thanks so much. Have a great and wonderful day. How shall